Psalm 51, if you have a Bible, it's been said by followers of Jesus, I'm saved. And then, well, I'm, I'm being saved. It's a process. There's growth. There's maturity. And then thirdly, one day I will be completely saved. I'll be in heaven. See, here's the deal with that. Here's the situation. When, when you first begin to realize that God is drawing you to himself, that he's knocking on the door of your heart, that he's calling you to come and follow him, well, you have to decide. You have to choose to turn from as much as you know of your wrong, your sin, and to give as much as you know of yourself to all that at that time you know of God. So, so it has to do with uh, sin, self, and God. Th- those three things are, are the beginning. You turn from as much as you know of your sin to give as much as you know of yourself to all that you know of God. He calls you. He draws you. So sin is, well, you're leaving that. Self, you're giving of self. And then God, you begin a relationship or you begin to know him. And you continue to grow in that understanding of these three all through your life as a believer, as you follow Christ. You know, I remember when I first got saved. I knew that God wanted me to turn from things in my life that were wrong. I quit smoking cigarettes. To me, it was like, that was an obvious wrong for me. Both the kind that were legal, and then there were some that were illegal at that time. Now it's not a big deal, I guess. I was in Nevada recently and walking down the streets, and there was an old familiar smell. Lynn, do you know what that is? She goes, no, what is that? I said, you don't, you don't need to know what that is. <laughs> but I, I gave up that. I gave up the best I could, my language that was wrong, some of the thought life I had. Cleaned up my life the best I could with the Lord's help. I gave my whole self, I felt, to the Lord. I mean, I was going to church all the time. I I, I felt like I really knew God. He was awesome. He was amazing. He was good. And I was forgiven. But as I continued this, this walk with the Lord, as I continued to follow him, I found out there was a lot more to know and learn about him and from him. I had, I had found out a little bit about him as a new believer, but boy, I realized it, it, it's, it's, it's so much to learn, so much to know about the Lord. So much darkness in my heart and mind that I wanted to overcome and be free from. As the Lord revealed it to me in Scripture, exposed it. There's more of myself I wanted to surrender. And this process is never over. It's the process of a transformed heart, a transformed life that that continues from the day you realize, you open that door and let him in, this process, it starts and it continues. And it's a battle. It can be a struggle. There's there's great mountaintop experiences. There's valleys. There's victories. There's defeats. And sometimes you think, listen, let me have your attention. I don't know if you ever do this. Sometimes you think you've been a Christian for a while and you feel like you've overcome some certain things in your life. And sometimes you feel like, why am I still so stinking carnal? You ever feel that way? No, you're all just holy. And... <laughs> why do I still struggle with the same old stuff and self? Why am I not a more godly man, godly husband, godly woman, godly wife? And sometimes, if you're honest, you feel like a complete phony. 
You can get discouraged there and stuck. If not careful, defeat it. Don't you think, gosh, I thought I was through with that. I mean, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but, but how many of you still sin? <laughs> At least once a year. Okay, twice. How many times a day? Remember David? David had blown it, this, this man after God's own heart. I mean, he had great victories. There's no doubt about that. He had great victories. He had great defeats. And in Psalm 51, we see David sharing his heart, his, his, his situation after this terrible defeat with Bathsheba. And I, I draw your attention first to chapter 51 and this ongoing battle David has with obedience and transformation. It's the same ongoing battle that you and I have with obedience and the transformed heart. We'll pick it up in verse 5 where he says, I was brought forth in iniquity. I was born a sinner is what he's saying. And in sin my mother conceived me, and behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, verse 6, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Those parts of my heart that need to be continually transformed and changed. Purge me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Don't cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. David asks there in verse 8 for joy. Make me hear joy and gladness. And then he says that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Who, who crushed David's bones? Who restores David's heart? God restores the hurt, listen. God restores the fallen. God welcomes home the prodigal. God heals the crushed and the brokenhearted. And I want you to hear this. Please, please hear this up front and, and very clearly. I, I'm not encouraging you to stumble, to fall, to go prodigal. But what I am saying is this. God doesn't want you to give up. God doesn't want you to, 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 to think that you can't continue with him if you have fallen. God restores the broken heart, and he will not despise a broken heart. Verse 8, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. And then if you turn over to verse 17 of that psalm, it says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. But both these verses speak of the same thing, a broken heart, a, a, a place of difficulty and failure. When David says God has broken his bones, it's not like God the Father came down, you know, and broke his arm or his leg. It's not like David blew it, and God the Father, you know, goes, Gabriel, Michael, come here. You see, David, he's my boy. Go down and teach him a lesson. Break his bones. Don't kill him. Just, just break an arm, break a leg. This is not what's going on. This is not God Father. This is God the Father. What, he's, what David is saying is that the experience of conviction, of failure, of where he found himself and God's conviction that the guilt, the shame is, is like a broken bones. How many of you ever broke a bone here? Anybody? Not someone else's, but your own. You ever bro break one? 
very painful experience. Break an arm, break a leg. I'll never forget, grew up here in Pensacola on Scenic Highway, one of the biggest hills in our city, Gaborone. They had just paved it. It was, it was blacktop. There were no houses there at that time. I was probably about 13, 14. My brother and a couple of us took our skateboards and we were going to conquer Gaborone Hill. We were going to be the first to skate it. We're there early in the morning. Sun's coming up. We're flying down Gaborone Hill. I mean, it's amazing. And about my fourth time down, I'm flying down. This time I decided, you know, first you're doing one of these, just trying to slow down as you make your way. Then it's like you, you start going a little faster, a little faster. About my fifth time down, I'm going straight down. I hit the bottom, and my skateboard's wobbling like this. I, I get flipped. I land on this arm, and I broke it in two places. And I'm sitting in the car that we came in. You know, my brother comes over. What are you doing? I go, I think, I think I broke my arm. Yancey, I think I broke my arm. He goes, he looks at me, he goes, you didn't break your arm. Get back up there. And I'm going, no, I think it's broken. So I just sat in the car, and, you know, they all looked at me like I was this pansy wimp, you know, sitting in the car. And finally we went home, and I told my mom, I said, I, I think I broke my arm. She goes, no, you didn't break your arm. Next morning I got up, I tried to open the refrigerator. That's one, if a kid can't open a refrigerator... His arm is broken. <laughs> so it was. We, we had it put back together and spent the whole summer watching everybody else swim and go to the beach and felt useless, felt like I couldn't do anything. Because there's one thing you can't do is set your own bones. And that's a broken heart. You can't fix it. There's pain connected to it, over, over what you've done and who you've been when your heart is broken. This is David. Lord, my bones are crushed. He says to the Lord, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a contrite heart. These you will not despise. You feel useless to God when your heart's like that. That's how David felt, like a guy with a broken arm. You feel you can't, well, like the prodigal, I can't be a son anymore. Maybe he would make me his hired servant. That's the story. That's the situation. You know you need help. But I would submit to you that in some ways, in some situations, in fact, in all of them, the broken heart's a good thing in God's eyes. He won't despise it. He won't turn his back on it. I want to look at a couple of reasons why I believe this is true. If you, if you have a Bible, go to Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. There's a great verse there. It's up on the screen. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Here's, here's what's being said. Listen, David who's fallen, you who've fallen, we who've fallen, all of us who've had our bones broken, so to speak, and our hearts broken by conviction, the high and holy one says, in, I live in purity, I live in holiness, I live in heaven, but I also dwell with those with a broken and contrite heart. Now, now listen, when you humble yourself, when you're honest with yourself, when you're willing to admit to yourself your wrongs and you see your sin as they really are, then you can say, okay, God, deal with me. Change me. And God says this, I'm going to draw close to you. I, the Holy One who lives in heaven in all purity, I will dwell with you if you will come clean with yourself. If you'll be honest with who you are. The same God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, to the broken. God draws near to a broken heart. In Isaiah chapter 61, 
It says the spear of the Lord. This is what Jesus read from this passage when he was in the the synagogue in Nazareth when he started his ministry. He says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. And then he begins to describe the poor. He says, he had sent me to heal the broken hearted. Jesus, the Messiah, came to heal those whose hearts are broken. God the Father sends his son, and at the inauguration of his ministry in Nazareth, he, he tells us why. To heal brokenhearted, that's the top of his list. It's not the healthy who need a physician, Jesus would say, but the sick. Those who know they've blown it, those who are willing to admit it, those who are wrong, who've disobeyed and can't fix themselves, that's who he draws near to. This ongoing process of, of a healing and transformed heart, he comes to those who know. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. This is a similar saying, it's about the heart, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven, poor in spirit, another way to say brokenhearted. Now, now listen, to know that you can't come to God by your goodness, by your works, by things that you do that you think are holy and right, but because you're poor in spirit, yours is the kingdom. You may feel useless, you, you, you feel brokenhearted as you've blown it. It may seem like, God, I can't grow, I'm not moving forward. You feel unworthy. My life's not where it should be, God, you can't hang out with me. Well, you can come to the Lord in faith. Lord, here's what you say. You say you hang out with the brokenhearted. You say you come to the contrite. You say you sent your son to, to heal me. You say that the kingdom is for those. And Lord, that's me. That's me. I have this broken heart. And I'm finding out, Lord, it's a good thing in your eyes. Because then you can really deal with me. God doesn't resist the broken hearted, and neither should we. He comes to them. See, coming to Christ is not just a prayer, repeating a prayer that someone else leads you in, although it could be a part of it. Coming to Christ is not just coming to church, although that's a good thing. Coming to Christ is, is not just intellectually believing that Jesus is real and rose from the dead, although He did. Coming to Christ is not just being baptized, although that's great. Coming to Christ, and you see this all through Scripture, starts with, listen, a broken heart. That's the first step. First, your heart is broken over your own lifestyle or decisions, or you can call it sin, and you want to turn from everything you know that's wrong to allow Him to heal your broken heart. In Psalm 51, verse 8, make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Give me joy. Listen. The brokenhearted, when they come to the Lord, find joy. They find gratitude. They find gladness for who he is and what he's done. That, that's why people, when they worship, lift their hands and smile and, and are engaged. You know why? Because God has given them joy over the fact that they've been forgiven, and now they're in a relationship with the Lord. That's what worship's all about. Lord, here, Lord, give me joy. The broken heart is the place where the Lord pours in his grace, his love, his truth, and his life. And, and then when the heart stands before the Lord, it can't help but rejoice and be glad. Without a broken heart, without that sense of need for him or the gratitude because of what he's done, it's just, it's just religion. I go through the motions. I, 
have some understanding. Now, another picture or illustration, if you will, of this truth, this principle of a broken heart, I want to take you, you have to turn your Bible there to Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 3. It says, a bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. That passage begins with verse 1. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him, and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles or to the nations. God speaks of the Messiah his servant, the elect, the chosen, his delight, the one on whom his spirit dwells. And he says, this one that I will send, a bruised reed, he will not break. I don't know if you've been to many rivers that have reeds growing in them, and sometimes a storm comes and they bend or they break. Or probably the best illustration for us is after a storm comes through our area, through the Gulf of Mexico, and you can go out to the beach, had a good friend who was a structural engineer, took me out to the beach after Ivan came through, if you remember that storm. Couldn't get out there unless you had a pass. Or, so he said, do you want to go out there? I said, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to see what happened. And I went up on some of the dunes, and all the sea oats were either bent down or some of them were completely broken. It's a picture of this. A bruised reed or a broken sea oat. I mean, imagine walking along the beach and this beautiful place we have, and, and all, the, all you see is, is these, these, the storm has ravaged it, and they're all bent over and twisted. Or someone walked over them. It's the bruised reed or the, or the broken reed beat down by a storm, somehow hurt. Maybe you're here today. You feel hurt. You feel walked on or bruised. You feel weak or ready to quit. Maybe you feel vulnerable like like a reed is there in the river. That's the picture. And it says, a bruised reed, he will not break. That's a great promise from the Lord. At times, I think you allow the Lord to speak that to you. He will be with you in your weakness. He'll be with you in your storm. God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except which is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but he'll give you a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God's with the weak, he's with the vulnerable, he's with the hurt, he's with the bruised. A bruised reed he will not break. The Apostle Paul, boy, he, he, he knew this experience. Well, I'll read this passage to you from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul speaking of his ministry. He says this, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed, always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. And then Psalm. I'll read this one too. Psalm 103. beginning with verse 10. Speaking of the Lord, listen. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers 
that we are dust. Now, let me have your attention. God knows our limits. He knows what kind of reeds or sea oats that we are. He knows the storms that have come through your life. He, he, he knows the, the brokenhearted who are humble that will draw near to him. Jesus knows. I mean, he came as a man. He knows those limits. He knows what it's like to be tired. Jesus knows that. He stopped there outside the city of Samaria, and he sat by a well because he was tired. He was hungry. Jesus knows what it's like to be lonely. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. Jesus knows what it's like to be wounded. Jesus knows what it's like, and listen to this, Jesus knows what it's like to be abused, to be horribly abused. He knows. He'd been there. He's been wounded. He's been bruised. And a bruised reed, he says, he will not break. And a broken and contrite heart, he will not despise. Now the enemy will come to you and say this when you fall, when you stumble. Well, this time you've gone too far. You're too deeply wounded to be used by him. You might as well just settle for mediocrity. You're a phony. The Lord can't use you. Look at your life. You need to hear Jesus say this. He heals the brokenhearted. A bruised reed he'll not break. And, and, and one last picture there in Isaiah 42, verse 3. Let's bring that passage back up. Isaiah 42, verse 3. He will not quench, or he will not, smoking flax, he will not quench. That's, a, that's like a candle wick or a fire, smoky fire, if you will. He won't put out a smoky flax or fire or smoldering wick. The picture's like this. If you're, you know, I don't know if you ever tried to start a fire at a campfire. You've got a few twigs. Maybe the leaves are a little wet, and you keep trying to get this fire going, or maybe even in your own fireplace with some wet wood. The guy told you it was dry when he sold it to you. But it's not. It just keeps smoking. Initially, there's more smoke then there is fire. And you wonder, will this thing ever catch on? This is a picture of our life sometimes with the Lord. This smoky. There's, there's, there's fire, there's passion at times, there's zeal. But also you see the smoke, the smoke of disobedience, the smoke of lack of growth. And at times you feel like there's just more smoke than there is fire in my life. There's this process of the transformation of the heart. Sometimes you feel like it's not going anywhere. But I want you to remember that smoke and fire always go together. This is seen all through the Bible. With those who, who walked with the Lord, and it'll be seen, listen, it'll be seen all through your life. The smoke and the fire. The bruised reed. Peter's great confession. Lord, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Man, that's fire. And then Jesus says, yeah, but I'm going to the cross. Not so, Lord. He rebukes the Lord. That's smoke. Lord, though these all deny you, I'll never deny you. Well, that's some fire. Then he denied him three times by a smoky fire. That's some smoke. Thomas, lest I see the print in his hands and put my hand into his side, I'll not believe. That's smoke. And Jesus appears before him in his resurrected body. What does Thomas do? He falls on his hands and his face, and he says, My Lord and my God. Now, that's some fire. He sees the resurrected Christ. Man comes to Jesus, his son is demon-possessed, and the disciples had tried to cast him out and, and of no effect, and, and he's, he's, the Lord asks him, he says, do you believe? Lord, I believe. That's fire. I believe. Then he says, but help my unbelief. 
That's a bit of smoke mixed in there. The spirit is willing. It's a lot of fire. But the flesh, it's weak. There's your smoke. And this is the process. Paul spoke of it. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? That's smoke. Paul knew what it was like to battle with himself. And then the fire is, thanks be to God who gives us victory and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's some fire. There, there's this process of the, this, this transformed heart. We have grace and the power of the Spirit mixed with our struggle and our battle of the flesh and the love of the world. And if we focus too much on the smoke, we give up. We get discouraged. We get stuck. If we think it's all about God's grace, well, we won't take right responsibility for our part that we play. You know, stir up the gift that's within you. Study to show thyself approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. See, the Holy Spirit starts his fire in our hearts. And it's like, it begins pretty smoky at the beginning. You don't know as much. You don't let go as much. But I want to submit to you this. That if you keep a contrite heart, a broken heart before him, a humble heart, God doesn't allow the fire to be put out. It's his fire. He started it. You didn't. He came to you. He called you. He saved you. And recognize that the, the smoke and the fire always go together. I'm saved, but I'm being saved. And I'm in this process. I'm, I'm not who I used to be. Sometimes I am. Sometimes you are. But God will heal the broken bones. He draws near to a contrite heart. He recognizes someone who's not proud and, and, and he doesn't resist them. One day I'll be completely saved. But this you can be sure of as you walk through this smoky life, so to speak, this transforming of your heart, this, this, this time when you come before the Lord and say, Lord, restore the joy, restore these broken bones and you can be sure of this, that God heals a broken heart. He will not break a bruised reed, and he will not quench a smoking fire. God transforms a surrendered life. This is what he does. This is who he is. And he'll turn you, if you're letting, from as much of your sin as you know while you give him as much of yourself as you can to all that you know of him at this time in your life. And he will restore you, and he will use you, and his word to you would be don't give up. Don't give up. Because the broken heart is exactly what God works with the best. That's who he is. He didn't come to call the healthy. He came to heal the sickos like you and me. And he'll do it all through your life. And there'll be times when you think, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll just kind of continue at this stage. And God said, no, 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 don't, no. Humble yourself. Come before me. Repent. And watch what only I can do with a broken and contrite heart. That's the story of the walk with the Lord. That's the hope and the great expectation from the Lord. And that's the hope that you and I have in the Lord.